uh, welcome to day five of uh, the Towards the Lunar Generation workshop. Uh, today we're going to talk about science on the moon. And to do that, we have Bernard Foing with us. Uh, professor Foing is a professor of space and planetary sciences at VU Amsterdam. Uh, he's a former scientist at the European Space Agency, executive director of the International Lunar Exploration Working Group and was the principal project scientist for SMART-1, the first European mission to the moon, among many other uh, uh, missions. Uh, also worked for three years as an astronomer in Chile at the European Saturn Observatory. Uh, I know, Bernard, you have a lot, of, a lot more projects that you're gonna share with us, so I'll leave it at that, and the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. So, okay, it's a pleasure to talk from the moon and uh, to address uh, our um, Space Generation Advisory Council uh, family and uh, Moon Village Association. As you know, I am also a founder of the SGSC in uh, Unispace 3 uh, in 1999 in Vienna. And so I follow with my heart and also with our common passion what you are doing. So I would like to share with you uh, some um, uh, experiment activities we have uh, performed to explore the Moon and Mars. And uh, that's a program uh, we started Actually, uh, so we started uh, uh, more than 12 years ago after we had uh, launched our mission to the moon and Mars. Uh, so mission to the moon was smart one, which I was uh, in charge of. And also I was involved with Mars Express and now I work on ExoMars. And uh, so we created a platform uh, called Your Moon Mars uh, to uh, uh, analyze the data, but also to develop instruments for the next uh, generation of uh, missions. And also we look forward to uh, the moon and Mars village, uh, making a training for what uh, uh, you know, humans will do on the basis of the moon and Mars. And so when we created uh, this, uh, also a series of, of uh, initiatives uh, connecting uh, uh, space, moon, Mars and society, even including arts and other activities. So every year we have uh, some young professional joining us. And so in, the, in average, we have about 10, 15 uh, working with us for master research or for other uh, uh, studies. And the last year we have got 30. So we have got even increasing activities in this uh, Your Moon Mars Astronautics Training Academy. And so I've put the first name of them, I don't have enough space to put the full name uh, from uh, the recent years. So we started building on the uh, result that we obtained with uh, our Mars mission, Mars Express that you have heard, we launched in 2003. And uh, that has really revolutionized our view of Mars by providing high resolution images of Mars and measurement of water ice uh, at the pole, methane. We had the proof that there was recent volcanism on Mars and even there were some glacier on the tropics of Mars. We followed also the atmosphere and um, we found also uh, water in various forms, including in liquid form in the subsurface using a radar. And also we used uh, uh, Mars Express to uh, support the Mars Expression rover and then the Mars uh, Perseverance. So here I have put a gallery of some of these results from Mars Express. And um, we have uh, then had a number of uh, grants and activities for young professionals to analyze. So after this, we uh, thought, okay, we could also do um, Earth analog simulation of Mars and the Moon to validate what we had obtained with our mission. And uh, so we used the Utah Mars Desert Research Station Lab, and uh, then we organized a yearly a series of uh, simulation. You know, you lock uh, six researchers in a Moon base or Mars base, and they, pro they perform laboratory research but also they go on the field because it's a beautiful analog for the moon and Mars, and they do geology and astrobiology. But also um, we brought some new instruments like the one we want to uh, use in the next generation of missions, so cameras, spectrometers, communication system, rovers, drones. And also we accomplished some traverses with rover or with humans, and we use also new instruments. This is also an opportunity to test uh, habitat technologies. Huh? You know, how are you going to uh, live and work on the moon base or in a Mars base? And so we uh, 
have um, done some advanced design of what could be the next uh, um, uh, um, architecture and layout of what we would have on the moon and Mars. We look also at power system, uh, gray water, great house, and we have also in the ground uh, um, floor uh, laboratory where we can analyze the uh, sample. Now it's also a great platform to study human aspect, how humans survive, physiology, but also how they work together socially, especially in an intercultural environment, and um, uh, how they stay in good health and also they perform the research. And above all, also it's a great platform for training young researchers and also advanced researchers because there is a, also an intergenerational exchange which is very important, and also to outreach this uh, um, journey uh, to the rest of the world. So here is a proof that uh, you know, Mars, as seen by Mars Express, is very, very similar to this analog where in the Utah desert, you see some of this uh, ancient river, uh, inverted riverbed, which is less eroded than the neighborhood. And then that uh, says a bit on the top, like we see on Mars. And you have also some deposit of special minerals that you can analyze uh, with uh, images or also with spectra, with spectrometer. So in the laboratory, we brought some instruments like X-ray instrument that can measure either the elemental composition of rocks or the mineral composition of rock. That's the one with this orange case. Actually, this is a, a terrestrial copy of an instrument which was brought by NASA and uh, in particular by Ames Research Center, Dave Blake, then we borrowed his instrument to use it on Earth, but uh, he has analyzed rocks on Mars with this instrument, on the uh, Mars uh, Curiosity. But we had uh, also visible inference, infrared reflectors. We have Raman, Raman spectrometer. That you shoot a laser and then you, you measure a light, which is uh, uh, shifted at a different wavelengths that gives you a signature of uh, the mineral or the organic sector. We use also microscopy technique, and you can see a, a close up with a microscope of some rocks, and you see, oh, there is some layer of a, a micro uh, biology uh, uh, layer of film which is able to suck the rock and survive in this desert. We even brought for the first time a technique, you know, all, you all know about PCR, huh? we are all in the middle of PCR now, but this was the first. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, brought in a desert 12 years ago, and we could analyze in situ the DNA of some of the microbes that we could find in this desert. And then after we picked some samples, and then we sent them to the most advanced laboratory in the Jet Propulsion Lab, in the NASA Ames, at ESTEC, at Amsterdam, at the Imperial Advisors University, to analyze their um, astrobiology content, organics, uh, amino acids, uh, big molecules, uh, microbial. So it was a great astrobiological research we could perform. There. Now we also performed uh, some extravehicular research. So there uh, you, you go either with the rovers, you send the rover as a scout, because it's a, you know, you need one hour to, uh, in the airlock between the base and the outside. So sometimes that's sort of too tired. I say, okay, I send a rover to do the prospection and then I go only to the places that the rover has identified. But then eventually you go out and we brought a ground penetrating radar that was provided by Jet Propulsion Lab. We had also drill and you could get some sample that's two meter depths. And that's very important for instance for Mars because we believe that you need to go to this uh, depths so that the uh, uh, organic molecule would have survived cosmic radiation and also the um, extreme uh, uh, oxidized environment in, on the surface of Mars. So we had uh, also uh, so this uh, rover camera as instrument and so on. And we could measure as a function of depth the distribution of uh, mineral organics and even like popular form. So it's a great training for what we do on Mars. So also at that time, we said, okay, uh, let's uh, see uh, how we could contribute to the next uh, robotic village on the moon. And there, uh, there was the time of the Google Lunar X Prize competition. You know, you could win $20 million if you would be the first commercial company to land on the moon. So we worked with one of the company and we built our own uh, small lander. And uh, we tested really with a non-professional 
what type of instrument you could put on it to do science. So we had some cameras, we had some rovers, we had some spectrometers, and then we learned how to operate them remotely, like uh, the lander would be on the moon. So here we also tested uh, some cooperative robotics. So our two rovers deployed from the lander can work with each other and with the lander. So one rover equipped with an arm, the other rover equipped with an instrument to analyze. And we play this game actually in a, in a field area, volcanic area that is similar to what is on. Here, you see, we even put the lander on the moon, as you can see that with an astronaut, uh, almost. Uh, actually, this was in the Eiffel uh, volcanic region, so close to the European Astronaut Center. And we did uh, this test with the Austrian Space Forum uh, astronauts. So this was our campaign in the Eiffel volcano region where we looked also at the human, lander, and robotic partnerships. So here I had done also a number of, uh, uh, you all hear me, huh? all fine. Huh? And uh, so we had also a number of uh, uh, students, including even some Air Force French cadets that want to be astronauts. They also train there uh, to, to work and live on the moon. So we also went to another analog of the moon and Mars. And this is Iceland, Iceland where you have volcanoes, you have also glaciers and you have lava tubes. And so we did some campaign uh, there in particular inside the lava tube. We looked out to explore it. And actually we have uh, done a number of campaigns there. And this year we will have uh, also a European Mars Iceland campaign organized by a group of young professionals and it's called Chill Ice. And they are going to work with, they bring a, a team of 20, but, uh, there will be three astronauts at the time, and these three astronauts will deploy an emergency shelter in the laboratory. And this will be from end of July to the 10th of August. Another place that we have used, where we have put a moon base, is um, Hawaii, uh, and on the Mauna Loa volcano. And uh, there is a base called IC, which was uh, built uh, some five years ago. Uh, by uh, Hank Rogers. He is the owner of the Tetris uh, company and he invested some of his uh, uh, revenues into exploration and green energy. And he built this facility that he, had, he rented for NASA for long duration psychology studies of six months or 12 months. And uh, then uh, two years ago, we created, uh, after we finished the experiment with NASA, um, a new uh, foundation called the International Moon Base Alliance that is using this facility to do short-term campaign, like two weeks or four weeks, which are more uh, similar to what we'll have as the first uh, sorties on the surface of the moon. And so also now, we uh, so we did a campaign with enclosures. And, uh, so I brought a drone, and we brought some microscope and we analyzed samples. We also tested vehicle to explore the place. And that's a place how it looks like really like a moon base because you, you are surrounded by volcanoes similar to the, uh, the volcanoes on the moon and it's all solar powered. And uh, so we, you can organize a campaign and now we organize every year uh, many campaigns of the two weeks duration for the simulating what will be a traverse and uh, um, an outpost uh, uh, expedition to the surface of the moon. So actually I'm looking at uh, uh, we are going to do uh, this campaign called European Mars International Moon Base Alliance ICES, so on short EMIS. So if you want to, to win an EMIS, you can uh, uh, candidate and be part of our EMIS campaign, first to 15 December. And we have already part of the group that we are looking for, for more uh, research. Here for two of my master's students in geology, they were doing their project, uh, uh, picking uh, rocks from the surface to see how they are altered by uh, water processes. And uh, so to, to compare it to Mars rocks, and it actually is simple. Uh, no, you have about 1.5 meter of water uh, falling per year in Hawaii. So in, uh, in one year, you can simulate 1 million years of water on Mars. Huh? So, and you can see the same processes of alteration, uh, oxidation. And then my other student, uh, Sebastian, looked at samples uh, taken from lava tubes, uh, which were also partly produced by biomineralization, by some 
microbes that uh, also uh, process and form. So here you see the documents are samples uh, and uh, to uh, before they retrieve some of them for analysis. So why do we do that in the moon uh, perspective? Uh, okay, we want to uh, have a sustainable presence of humanity on the moon. You know, um, now we have been uh, for 20 years, uh, the, we had a permanent humanity presence in orbit on the International Space Station and uh, with rotation of crew. And we'll have the same, uh, possibly from 2030, where we'll have always uh, somebody in a, in a moon, in moon base. So what about Mars? Mars, uh, clearly, uh, this year is the year of Mars. Uh, so we had the Mars Perseverance uh, uh, launch in July last year and the landing in February. Beautiful uh, feat and deployment of uh, uh, the, the lander, the Ingenuity uh, uh, helicopter, and uh, now also the other experiment. So some of the first uh, view from uh, Perseverance. We had also a, Japan, a Chinese uh, uh, lander, so mission Chang one that includes the big orbiter and also a lander that is called the drone, and the lander uh, deployed a uh, rover on the surface of Mars. Here are first images of Mars from the Chang one one orbiter, and uh, some views of the rover on the surface of Mars. Now in Europe we have uh, the ExoMars program, where in 2016 we launched already the trace gas orbiter that is monitoring the, the Mars atmosphere. And also we had a demo technology lander going to the surface of Mars, uh, where we tested a lot of uh, challenges for re-entry and descent, and eventually touched down. So we touched down Mars, but uh, at a bit higher speed than expected. So we had some malfunction at the end, but uh, we are preparing now everything so that uh, our next big mission, ExoMars rover 2022, uh, will be successful to put a rover that we have na named Rosalind Franklin, which is equipped with a payload called Pasteur. And this payload will search for life extinct or extant on Mars. And possibly also it has a dream that can go to two meter depths where this uh, life could have survived uh, radiation uh, from the uh, cosmic rays. So uh, now I would like to share with you some uh, latest news where uh, we have been in uh, Etna. Etna is also a great analog of uh, the Moon and Mars because it has a fresh volcano. And we went there in 2017 with a team from the German Aerospace Agency. Um, we had built a big lander about 2.5 meter high, uh, which uh, you know in preparation for a real lunar mission, and uh, we deployed. Two um, autonomous intelligent rover uh, to show what you could do from the surface of the moon. Here, for instance, you have a, a, a movie of uh, this uh, very nice rover uh, making a rendezvous with the lander, uh, and then you have a series of a payload uh, placed in boxes. You know, you know of this mascot uh, uh, box that was put on the the asteroid uh, Ryugu uh, by the German Aerospace Agency. And uh, we are using similar concept, uh, payload in a box, but they are attached to the lander and the rover with its arm, dexterous arm, come take the box of instrument and put them in the side. This, this is a box that was containing a seismometer and we could measure the earthquake of Edna in a similar way that we will want to do measurement of the moonquakes. But uh, uh, next year, we are planning another big campaign. We are going to deploy two rovers like this one, and also an ESA rover called Interact, which can be operated from the International Space Station. And we'll have also an astronaut that will teleoperate the ESA rover. So we plan to have a big campaign with 50 DLR people, 20 ESA people. So this was planned actually for last year, but we had to postpone it uh, because of COVID to uh, June 2022. But if some of you are interested to join in, you are all welcome to contact me. So we will have also new experiment where we'll uh, uh, get some samples, analyze them in situ. And we are going also to install a radio telescope with four uh, antenna 
uh, to um, uh, demonstrate the possibility to do very low frequency radio astronomy from the moon. And this would have big promise, uh, not only to monitor the sun and Jupiter, we are going to start with that, but after to monitor uh, our universe uh, at the time of the dark ages. So when it didn't emit much uh, optical photons, but uh, there was still some radio emission that we can detect now, and then we can have some views of the very early universe. So here are okay, some views of uh, this uh, rover in front of Mount uh, Etna, and it was quiet at that time, but this year we decided to organize a, a, a small campaign with 12 of my Euro master students, and we went there, but it was just an epoch with some eruption, so it was covered with new ashes. Actually, we had a good, uh, uh, very great experience also of uh, witnessing in real time an eruption uh, and a lava flow, a lava fountain of 300 meters uh, just uh, overnight from a sail distance. So here are some of the motion of the rovers uh, that are uh, making rendezvous uh, with the lander. Actually, they can be also recharged by uh, induction from the lander and then they can operate. They are also completely intelligent in the sense that they can by themselves uh, uh, take this payload, but they can also explore a region so, uh, uh, that's completely new. So they have some nice algorithm for navigation and for uh, discovery. So beautiful uh, uh, state of the art, uh, robotic and intelligence uh, technology for this system. So we are looking forward to our next uh, campaign. So now this year, okay, we had initially planned a big campaign, but because of COVID, we postponed to next year, but still with uh, my young uh, uh, Mars team, uh, we uh, decided to do a scouting campaign and we went there to a crater uh, close to the summit, Crater del Laghetto, and study uh, this environment, to collect sample, to measure also some of this. Uh, that's where we were. Huh? So that's a, a map. Before you go somewhere, you take some satellite images and you try to plan what you are going to do. That's so here we explore both this system at that crater and this crater in the Laghetto. And uh, this is uh, actually this year, I have a mixture of uh, three teams. We have a team from the TU Dublin. Huh? So we, uh, we have Kevin uh, he's operating a drone, but he wants also to be an astronaut. So we train him and making uh, uh, do all the physical effort. We have Hannah, she has a portable spectrometer with which she can analyze the reflectance of rocks and their composition, but also she developed a technique where you, she can detect life from the spectral signature of uh, rocks. We have Shirayu with a rover, with the, our little rover we call Rover for Your Moon Mars Investigation or Remy. And uh, they, uh, it was, uh, we put on the rover a panor panoramic camera, a bit uh, similar to, to prepare the panoramic camera that we have on the Euromars rover. And then we have a Gary uh, that uh, is, uh, is seen with, uh, with uh, Shirayu and Anna is deploying an antenna for radio studies of the sun and Jupiter. So that's my Dublin team. And you see, uh, we even tested uh, the device uh, in Holland, uh, where we are based, we put the lander, we landed on the beach, and uh, we tested uh, the deployment of the rover, the panoramic camera, the drone, and even, we, we, I think we can use them for water world. And this is our rover. Then we also tested uh, the system uh, just uh, by ESTEC, the European Space Research Technology Center. We have uh, there, uh, a yard that we can test with drone, with a rover. And, and we were also joined by a team that uh, have joined me this year, which are dedicated to prepare for the ExoMars mission, the ExoMars rover, the research for life. So we have uh, Anu, that's an astrobiologist that is interested in searching for signature of life and with some instrument, like Raman. We have Patricia, she's our chief geographer looking at all the map from orbit and looking at where we are going to land and what we are going to study with the Mars rover. We have Leander from Vienna is studying large organic in space and how they are delivered to Mars. And then we had also Gaia from Bari 
and uh, she developed a system to simulate the images that we will obtain with a uh, one camera or with others. And also she loves to, to um, take picture of the team for our church. So we have this team. And we have also two astronomers with us. And then you see, here for you see, you can see Anouk uh, with the Raman spectrometer, that instrument that is shooting at rocks and you measure uh, what comes out of this uh, modified uh, laser light and you can get uh, the signature of rocks or biomarkers. So we have Patricia, she made a survey of the area we wanted to visit in advance. And actually between 2017 and now she realized that the size of the crater had changed because of the, the fall from ashes from the recent eruption. So uh, we try to every year to publish, uh, we have some uh, master thesis, article, conference abstract published by all these uh, young explorers that are before this program. So um, these are some views of uh, craters on Mars uh, that we obtained, we measured with Mars Express, where you can see caldera. So you see uh, you have a lava lake. And then uh, when the magma chamber gets empty up the, the interior caldera, then you can actually um, determine the age of Martian calderas uh, by counting craters. And we found that uh, some of these calderas on Mars are very young. And uh, there have been some volcanism very recently. That was a big surprise for me, Mars Express. And actually, here also on the, in Edna, we uh, we also measured some calderas. So uh, as I managed to get the talk in thirty minutes, uh, we have also the opportunity to go through the, really the uh, breaking news of uh, some of the campaign that we organized uh, last. Uh, last week. And so I have prepared a little slideshow of uh, our expedition. So do you see that? Yeah, so, okay, so let's go in order. Oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah, so sorry. I, so let, we go to, for, for the start. Yeah, so first, before we go there, you prepare. So you look at the map and uh, uh, recently, there have been some uh, big eruption in in April already, and you see some of this uh, uh, <coughs> recent lava flow that uh, have been coming out of uh, of uh, the the crater of right now. And some of them sometimes are cutting roads, but here we were in a safe condition. We also uh, made the use of some very detailed uh, stereo maps to have also an idea of where we would be able to, to go with our feet. And here are some of the maps that I've shown before. Uh, also, you have to solve logistics, uh, how you go there, <laughs> what road. And we are based actually in Catania. Catania is a bit uh, completely the lower right, below Archie Reale. And uh, the first, uh, uh, second night when we were in Catania, before going up, it was also the uh, as it was the semi-final of the Cup, <laughs> Euro Cup. So we watched it from Catania, and uh, then uh, in the middle of the night, after uh, Italy uh, won, uh, we were woken up uh, and realized that uh, the volcano at 40 km distance was starting to be in an active phase. We went outside and we uh, went under a rain of ashes going to our hair. Then we watched it with some te telescope from the beach. And the day after, we went up to get closer uh, to the, where we had uh, our base and, uh, and the refuge. So, okay, so we proceed there. This is the top view. And actually, the, yeah, so some of the recent activities are uh, okay from uh, this uh, southeast uh, crater. So we went up and uh, you see, we started to test uh, some of our equipment. This is the, the drone, this is a team uh, with uh, four Dublin, the four lips and two astronomers and also uh, from DLR, the Dr. Armin Bedler who is organizing the big campaign of uh, arches for next year in it. Okay, some views from the scene. And this is a view of a, a, a previous big, uh, uh, lava, uh, you know, sea that uh, 
were formed in the previous episode. So we first explore the area. Here, a panoramic image of one crater called Cisternaza that uh, we we explore, which is very difficult to go in. More easy to go in with the rover, but very difficult to go out, as you can imagine. This is our little uh, rover, Remy, that we test. And you see in the background the Etna volcano that is in activity. So we also close the residence. We did some tests with astronauts. We had a refuge there, so we first tested all the equipment. Uh, so we have the equipment with cameras, with drones, with rovers, with spectrometer. Here for this test of a, of a box with a spectrometer to analyze samples. Here you can see from the sample with a, a fiber going to the spectrometer, a Raman spectrometer, and also a close up uh, camera that can uh, see 20 micron on the sample. So we had also our little rover. You see, it's uh, you know, in fact, it's quite small. And we did also some uh, planetary protection protocol uh, study. This is a pan cam that uh, uh, allows us to do panoramic images of the landscape. So we test all the system in at proximity from our residence. You can see here this is an uh, old lava flow, so the vegetation has taken over already a bit. And then in the middle of the night, after we had just started, uh, finished our work, and uh, at the end of the dinner, suddenly somebody said, oh, there is smoke on the volcano. So we were starting to watch that. We were also doing some astronomy uh, uh, there with very dark sky. We did some tests with a drone, um, testing experiment. And you see some of the, um, the the smoke going out of the volcano. So this is a uh, <laughs> okay. That's a uh, the scene where we were visiting the DLR rover with our own rover, and we uh, yeah, we simulated the inspection of a rover that uh, would be stocked, and uh, how we would help each other. Yeah, I say all robots. On, yeah, so we inspect the wheel, we help each other. So that's what we call the robotic village. You know, we are villagers. You are the Moon Village Association. We do that already with robots. Mm -hmm. Good. Then, okay, we have also a team analyzing samples that are picked uh, by the rover, uh, still with, uh, uh, okay, in a laboratory, which is uh, outdoor. We can measure the composition of these rocks. We even bought an um, art experiment. And so this art experiment is called Moon Gallery. So we want to, to put the first museum of art on the moon. And for this, we uh, are buying a slot to bring 100 pieces of art. But it, gets, it costs 1 million euro per kilogram. For this reason, we, we miniaturized completely the gallery. And the gallery is this size, 10 by 10 centimeters. Each art piece is only one cubic centimeter. And we have a, a number of artists that have already contributed. And so here we were testing how we could deploy this uh, moon gallery on the surface of the moon from a um, uh, 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 box that is landed on the surface. Of the moon. And then in the middle of the night, oh, we saw that uh, the volcano was starting to uh, be active. So this is a Okay, first uh, view of a volcano that I just at the very beginning. And then after one hour, it started to develop some of this uh, uh, spiral uh, shape volute that would rise up to 300 meters high. And we just spent the whole night watching at these beautiful uh, uh, views. And, and uh, so that the beginning, you see the lava fountain. And then after some time, <laughs> the lava fountain fills uh, the crater, and then the crater overflows the lava overflow, and then you have a lava flow that uh, goes down. Uh, and I, actually, it, it was coming in our direction, but at a safe uh, uh, flow speed, so we didn't have to evacuate. We were just at four kilometers from the lava flow. So okay, so, and then the day after, we went up to uh, <laughs> again on on the. Um, all the lava field to analyze some of the samples. Here, we deployed the radio 
dipole to measure the sun and uh, Jupiter. Uh, we uh, even uh, collected some sample. <laughs> there is one technique, just put uh, your skin on the floor and the sample are so sharp that they just stick and uh, into your skin. <laughs> that's a new technique. And here, that's... Um, and that's here we landed. That's how we landed our payload box on the surface of the moon. And then after from the payload box, we deploy the camera, feed, mount it up, and then we have some rovers that uh, uh, is going out of the box. And then this rover is visiting the DLR rover. And then eventually is venturing to quite a dangerous uh, uh, crater. And uh, well, this is a little view of a rover going down slope. And uh, it went uh, very fast on slope, but uh, we had to call for an astronaut to recover it uh, uh, to come, uh, come back. So here, uh, the rover helped to deploy this moon gallery, and you can see the smoke of the volcano in the background. And so some operation, and this is uh, the, the team that we had uh, for this uh, um, Moon Mars uh, Etna campaign. Okay, so here, the, um, the astrobiologist is speaking some samples and here are some views of uh, astronomy uh, uh, studies of jupiter using the radio antenna and we had also beautiful sky there these are measurement of the, the burst uh, from uh, the jupiter and we had also a very nice uh, the, uh, an obs uh, a telescope from the Catania Observatory that, that we use to observe the sky, sky but also we observe the, the eruption. And you can see some views of uh, us looking at Jupiter and at the same time in the background, you can see the volcano <laughs> in the eruption. Okay, so that's uh, um, <laughs> eventually after we went back and we uh, recovered by enjoying the beauty of uh, this island. So in short, Yes, that's uh, how we try to prepare for um, working and living on the moon and Mars. We analyze data from space missions, but also we develop instruments that we test in terrestrial analogs. And also we have uh, some uh, isolation simulation where we learn how to live inside a moon base or a Mars base. And uh, we train as a full um, researcher astronaut. And so if you are interested, we are Really looking forward to continue working with the uh, space generation, with Moon Village Association for some of this uh, hands on research project. So, uh, so welcome uh, and looking forward to uh, uh, also a, a great uh, workshop and also good uh, luck in your careers and in uh, our work to, together um, towards the Moon Village. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, so I'll start yes. uh, with sharing with those. Um, what critical role will rovers and robots play in establishing a future moon village? Alexandra asks. Yes, well, good question, Alexandra. So actually, so the, the moon village vision we already proposed like 25 years ago in the frame of the International Lunar Exploration Working Group and which was a federation between agencies, academia, industry. And we had proposed a roadmap towards the moon village. First phase is a phase with the orbiter that are making a reconnaissance. And these are robotic orbiter. And then the next phase uh, would be a surface robotic village with various assets in different places. And uh, with this, not only we explore different regions, but also we can be connected, have collaboration, between countries and actors to have similar standards of communication. We can also share some infrastructure. And uh, these robots and robots can be uh, uh, heavy duty in the next phase where uh, they can contribute to build up uh, some human outputs, post part of the human output. So once we, we look at how to use uh, uh, some modules, have some inflatable structures that can be also uh, deployed partly with the help of a, a robot. And also, we have uh, studied uh, the possibility to use a robot to uh, 
um, to use soil and cover some of the structure with soil, eventually also using 3D printing techniques to create a, a protective shield against radiation and metal And so this, it, this would allow to prepare some of these outposts for short visit by astronauts. And then we would look at a transition where it would be a series of uh, human mission, remote mission to make this uh, habitat uh, more permanent. And then we would have a, a, a permanent uh, human uh, outpost. And that's really one of the key milestones of the moon village to have a, a permanent but sustainable human presence uh, on the moon. And to make it sustainable, you have to make it sustainable in terms of energy, in terms of resources, but also in terms of a value for Earth. And for the, some of the value you gain in terms of knowledge, maybe uh, using some of the resources, uh, uh, in situ, or uh, making some benefits, like uh, for society, for, for uh, tourism, or for uh, business. With this, you could then create, uh, uh, buy some products from Earth to bring to them. And this way, it will be economically sustainable. But we want also to have it uh, sustainable in the sense that we want to, to protect uh, the moon as a place for the future generation. So we want, if we use some of the resources, to do it in a very efficient way and without uh, uh, disturbing the environment. You just uh, mentioned about using resources from the moon. And our next question is related <laughs> to that. How far are we from developing mining rovers that are able to extract large amounts of minerals in order to create a market on the moon? And how it, far are we from being able to mine moons helium-3? Yes, in terms of the market and exploiting resources, if, uh, um, I believe, and also the community believes, the best resources to extract uh, are extra resources that have no weight. So what type of resources? Photons, information, they have no weight. You send them from the moon, almost no cost, and they have huge value. Then you have other resources that you could use in situ. Like for instance, we found some deposit of uh, water ice at the poles of the moon, and they would have extreme value, uh, for instance, for a moon base, and because at the moment it, it costs uh, you easily uh, 100,000 uh, euros to send one liter of water to the moon. And uh, if you can extract it uh, there in the place, and in particular, I made a calculation based on the, uh, a result from recent mission, you expect to have uh, 1 billion tons of water ice that could be available in some of these permanently shadowed region of the moon uh, in the top two meter. So there is quite a lot of stuff. And I'd say if we give us a limit, or we don't use more than 0.1% of these resources, already this is really 1 million ton. And with a good recycling, you could uh, sustain not only a moon base, but even you could extract some of this uh, water ice and use it, for instance, uh, for rocket that you launch from the moon. And you know, to launch from the moon costs you about 40 times less energy than to launch from Earth because of a lower gravity, you don't have an atmosphere to cross. And so there could be a beautiful market at, at the beginning where we, you could uh, 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 explore this ice, create hydrogen and oxygen, a small uh, rocket. And then, for instance, you could use this rocket to uh, displace um, satellites that are in Earth's orbit, or you could extend the lifetime of some of these satellites. So let's say, Telecom satellite costs 1 billion euro. If you can extend its lifetime by 10 years with this small rocket, it's a huge market. And so that could be something where um, uh, resources like water from the moon could be uh, used. Um, but uh, uh, otherwise, to bring sample to Earth, of course, they have a great scientific value, sample. And uh, some eventually rare Earth elements could be also having some value to be brought to us or object made on the moon. And, uh, because I think people would want to buy an object on the moon. And uh, the moon could become like a, a place for manufacturing a product at some stage. So, but also there is a possibility to, to harvest helium-3 
And as you know, AM3 is, uh, you, know, you don't find it on Earth. And uh, AM3 would uh, allow to perform a nuclear fusion uh, in a clean way. It doesn't produce any uh, neutron when you, when you fuse AM3, and then you don't create radioactive waste. And uh, I calculated that, uh, for instance, uh, if you have uh, one ton of uh, AM3, Oh, no, sorry, 10 tons of AM3. Uh, this could supply the energy for Europe for one year. So that's, uh, you know, one cargo per year, and uh, then I got the energy for you. But it's in so small quantity on the moon, you have to harvest, uh, you know, like one million times more stuff in order to extract AM3. So we have really to, to see uh, how you could do that in a clean way and also. You, you have other products that you can harvest uh, some rare earth metal. So you could have an old chain and then build uh, some reserve of GM3 as, as a back product, but over a long duration of subsurface operation. Also, you could do all that subsurface without changing the, the landscape of the surface, which uh, you know some uh, many of us in some culture do not want to, to change the surface of the moon. Shifting towards more science, I guess, yeah. how is, because you do the Euro Moon Mars activity, so it's both Moon and Mars, um, obviously you look at synergies between lunar activities and Mars activities, but how are they different? How is science uh, and scientific studies on the Moon different from what uh, you would study on Mars? Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, science, uh, you have a big uh, synergy. Uh, geological science are similar because you know, they started both as volcanic worlds, so they have very similar rocks. And then Mars uh, got more uh, altered by the presence of uh, uh, the atmosphere, some processes. So here is some difference, but very similar tools uh, can be used to analyze the geology of Martian and lunar rocks. When there is a difference, is a possibility that there was some life that appeared on Mars. And this we don't believe is the case on the moon. So for astrobiology research, uh, Mars is a very special place where you have to have a very sensitive techniques, but also you have to take extreme care not to uh, destroy the evidence. So you have uh, some planetary protection uh, protocol we have to apply if we go to Mars, not to contaminate it, and also not to contaminate the Earth when we come back with samples. So it's very restrictive and so that's, specific to Mars. On the other end, we could test all this protocol on the moon. Uh, and so uh, ensure that we know well how to, uh, to manipulate samples and uh, back to Earth, ensuring that we are not going to contaminate uh, in each direction. So we could use also a research laboratory on the moon uh, to, to test all this protocol before we go to Mars. In particular, with humans, because uh, if you bring humans to Mars, uh, we have to be very careful not to, you know, humans are just an ecosystem. They are bringing, you know, millions of different species in their body. And then you, uh, then you invade uh, and uh, you can take over all fire and all the yeah. so, uh, so that's uh, uh, how you have to, to, to do eventually uh, to prepare on the moon uh, some of this uh, perspective. Now, uh, from the point of view of uh, learning to live off the land, uh, life support system, we can learn the moon, try to apply to Mars. Mars also, we will have some zones that uh, we will reserve for humans and other zones that we should reserve for robots, for, for uh, you know, for uh, astrobiology research. Okay. And then we go step by step to see how we can, uh, yes, uh, learn from what we do on the moon to apply to Mars, but also the moon being very close, it will be just a nearby continent of the Earth where we can have industrial activities. So now, um, um, yeah. I, I, I have there's to, one more question. Excellent. We, I'll take the last question because now, you know, I, I am at the International Space University in Strasbourg, uh -huh. and now I have to take a flight back uh, home. Ah, OK. And so the last <laughs> question, and then I will try to catch up from the airport, uh, possibly the panel. Yes? OK, perfect. Uh, what are the breakthrough reliable and realistic techniques to generate in situ abundant power and or energy uh, as on the lunar surface for lunar missions. Yeah, so energy, we have solar power during 
daytime. And so for more, half of the moon, the month of the moon, uh, you have daytime two weeks, and then you have two weeks of night, and you have big challenge to survive this uh, lack of energy. So we are looking at storage uh, technology. You could also use nuclear energy. But then at the pole, we found some places which are almost in permanent sunlight. So you could, in fact, at the beginning, start to install some bases at the pole. Uh, so that's for the energy. Uh, now there are other challenges uh, for uh, you will uh, need some uh, autonomy, uh, so some robotic system, and you can use some intelligent uh, robotic system to operate also in the absence uh, of, uh, of humans. Well, thank you, Bernard, for being with us today and with sharing all of your uh, experiences and uh, interesting missions that you're working on. Yeah, um, yeah, and Thanks have a good and so, so let's go uh, at the, to the moon and uh, Mars and uh, for the benefit of uh, humankind. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good much. day. All the best. And uh, I'll follow up tomorrow. I will be uh, back uh, to, to join the panel. All the best to Thanks. everybody. Thank you.